Welcome back to Mayo Clinic Radio. I'm Dr. Tom Shives. And I'm Tracy McRae. AI, or artificial intelligence, you know, it's one of the buzzwords that you hear people talk about these days. And and for a lot of us, I think it makes you think or imagine of, of humans being replaced by robots. And that's actually not too far from the truth. Mm. AI, or artificial intelligence, is defined as a computer system that can do things that humans require intelligence to do. Computers that can take over or actually mimic the function of our own brain. Now, it might be something as simple as a computer learning to play te- or learning to play chess or as complex as a driverless car. Ooh. So what does AI have to do with, with medicine? That's a good question. In the complicated world of healthcare delivery, researchers are looking for ways to use artificial intelligence to help improve patient care and make certain difficult jobs easier for healthcare providers. Here to discuss artificial intelligence and cognitive computing is Mayo Clinic oncologist Dr. Tafaya Haddad. Uh, Dr. Haddad is the physician leader for Mayo Clinic's collaboration with IBM Watson, and together they are developing a clinical trial matching program. Welcome back to the program, Dr. Haddad. It's good to see you. Great. Thank you so much for having me here. Dr. Haddad, so nice to have you. And I was glad to hear Tracy say that... uh, Artificial intelligence is going to make our job easier. (laughs) (laughs) Everybody's job easier. Well, that certainly is uh, the hope with uh, artificial intelligence and especially these cognitive computing systems, Um, not just to help make our job easier, but to make the job more efficient. Right now, we spend so much time trying to gather information from the electronic health record just to understand our patients and what has transpired since we saw them last, or if we're meeting them for the first time, trying to understand what are their medical conditions uh, and what brings them in today, what laboratory studies uh, might they have, what imaging studies might they have, and how can I harness all that information to provide a thoughtful consultation. Separate from that, we're also mining, you know, the PubMed, or the National Library of Medicine, and trying to understand the latest and greatest research. We also look to our society guidelines. Um, for me, ASCO or NCCN are these professional uh, societies that we belong to and really define sort of the best practice um, for cancer care here in 2017. So how can we navigate all of that information in in the National Library of Medicine, ongoing active research, guidelines, our own Mayo best practice guidelines, and the patient information. How can we match all that together efficiently? Right now, it takes a lot of human human hours and human effort, um, and a lot of time that we are sitting in our little workroom you know, sometimes 20 to 30 minutes before we even go sit and meet the patient in the, in the clinical exam room. Um, I think the hope with cognitive computing systems is that that information can be brought forward to us very quickly, very efficiently, um, and that we really would just be validating the data and then having this sort of list of treatment options that may be available, whether it's standard of care, guideline-driven care, or research, um, perhaps a clinical trial, and giving this patient access to the latest and greatest cutting-edge technology. So again, in one click, I can get that synopsis of the patient, her history, her medical records, um, laboratory imaging information, and marry that to our best practice as well as research opportunities. I spend less time in the workroom and more time with the patient, really getting a more meaningful encounter with the patient in the exam room. So it really does all the scut work for you. Precisely. <laughs> a, 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 it's a well-trained medical student or resident. <laughs> what is that? <laughs> scut work, why that's the menial jobs that most residents and interns do. Uh-huh. <laughs> but you really, it, it's very difficult to keep up in the world of medicine these days, right? And, and this true. artificial brain helps you do that? Well, that's exactly right. You know, we are limited as as human beings, not not even physicians. We're limited as human beings in terms of how much we can remember. Um, we don't have endless capacity that computers have. Um, and again, trying to keep up with the, the knowledge gains in medicine now are just uh, escalating at speeds we've never seen in the history of medicine. And, you know, one example uh, that has been published, you know, looks at medical students who started medical school in 2010. By the time they're going into practice in 2020, having completed residencies and fellowship, only 10% of all medical knowledge will be comprised of what they learned in medical school by 2020. So how we need these systems, we need help. 
um, to make sure that we are keeping up with, with the cutting edge and keeping up with research and keeping up with best practice. We, we absolutely need these systems. How did you get uh, hooked up with IBM to bring Watson in sure. to help with this? I mean, it's a big thing when you come to uh, Rochester, Minnesota, because you've got Mayo Clinic and IBM. And so it's great that the two are married in this project. Couldn't agree more. You know, I, I was just fortunate to be in the right place at the right time when the opportunity <laughs> presented itself, quite frankly. But um, Mayo made a, an investment, really, going back to uh, uh, 2013 to begin to explore uh, what is out there in terms of cognitive cognitive computing and to try and bring it into uh, the clinical arena, arena really to assess where is technology at. And you know, to work with an industry leader like IBM uh, was certainly the rich opportunity. They had a, a prototype in development at that time, one of their cognitive computing uh, systems called clinical trials matching. All right, so, sorry, you say you use the word cognitive so much. And, yes. and tell uh, me and our listeners exactly what you mean by that. I mean, just like a brain, a thinking computer? Excellent, so, so excellent question. You know, artificial intelligence really is about having an autonomous, uh, uh, human-like technolo technological system. Um, cognitive computing, on the other hand, is, is really sort of a, a branch of artificial intelligence. And it really utilizes, you know, th the best of what computers can do. Again, kind of data mining, pattern recognition, natural language processing, and develops these self-learning systems. When I, look at the, when I look at the difference of, you know, what does it mean to me as a, a clinician, you know, artificial intelligence would say, you know, based on all this information, uh, here is the best choice for this patient. Whereas cognitive computing systems would say, based on all the information, here is a ranked list of, of options, and, and, and this would be the preferred, but these are other potential options. And it really allows the physician then to do what we do best, is to take it into context with the patient's symptoms, their current functional status, things that computers couldn't possibly understand to deliver the information with compassion, things that a computer couldn't possibly do. So, so we, we do use the phrase cognitive computing systems to really represent uh, a branch of AI that I think is more what we are using uh, right now in, in medicine, or as, as it relates to medical decision making at least. So where is Watson? How do you access Watson? <laughs> Great question. <laughs> Got a lab coat. Do you bring coat. Watson with you? <laughs> Got a lab coat <laughs> wandering around the hallways. No, wonder, wonderful question. You know, it is, it is really uh, a, a meeting of the minds in collaboration with IBM. So we are working with their very best uh, computer science engineers, um, folks who are trained in in this discipline, computer science IT experts. Um, so really, I would say we are helping IBM train Watson um, to, to understand what is relevant to, I'm a breast cancer specialist, so what is relevant to breast cancer? What information do we want to have Watson focus on when Watson is reading the electronic health record? Well, if you're thinking about the cognitive thinking again, mm -hmm. as you mentioned, you'd have the list of things. Someone would have, the, the doctors Correct. would have to teach um, that shouldn't be number five on the list. That should be number two on the list. <laughs> and so it will only get more accurate as time goes on. That's exactly right. So, you know, one example that, that we learned is, you know, for our patients who have a hereditary breast cancer syndrome, they have a genetic mutation that predisposes them to breast cancer. You know, we know these BRCA1 and BRCA2 genes are important, and we wanted to teach Watson how to recognize whether or not a patient has one of these uh, genetic mutations. And it would seem very straightforward if Watson sees this, you know, he, you know, what he, she should um, <laughs> should be reporting it, uh, it back to us. But um, there were some instances where Watson wasn't picking it up in the record, and it's because we called it uh, a mutation, or we said the patient was a carrier. We didn't say the patient was positive. Mm for this mutation. So that's the type of tweaking and training that goes into, you know, making Watson smarter and able to to recognize the mm -hmm. information, but you're right with it with each iteration Watson does become smarter and eventually with more data uh, and more cases and more volume, the system self-learns. We're not quite there incredible. yet. <laughs> yeah. well, I can't wait to learn more about it. We're talking about artificial intelligence in the healthcare setting. Uh, Mayo teaming up with IBM's Watson, and we're talking with oncologist, cancer specialist, Dr. Tafaya Haddad. Time for a short break. When we come back, myth or matter of fact, for healthcare providers, every hour spent with patients requires two hours 
in front of a computer screen. Is that a myth or is it a fact? I'm you're, going, yes, that's true. <laughs> you're listening to Mayo Clinic Radio on the Mayo Clinic News Network. Welcome back to Mayo Clinic Radio. I'm Dr. Tom Shives. And I'm Tracy McRae. We are talking with oncologist Dr. Tafaya Haddad, and we're talking about artificial intelligence in the medical care setting. Incredible. It, you know, it's amazing what's going on right now in the field of medicine. And we'll talk more about that, but first this myth or matter of fact. Yes, myth or matter of fact for healthcare providers, every hour spent with a patient requires two hours in front of a computer screen. Is that a myth or is that a fact or would do we need to make it more? <laughs> Sadly, it's true, yeah. uh, and for all the reasons you know we had we had discussed here, uh, the way that electronic health records are set up right now uh, is it's impossible to get the information you need to care for a patient, to make a treatment recommendation, or to pursue additional diagnostic studies. Um, it, it takes a significant amount of time. Uh, similarly, when it comes to making those treatment recommendations, uh, we have to rely on the latest and greatest research that's published in the National Library of Medicine, as well as referring to you know, our guidelines uh, that help define best practice. So unfortunately, all that time is spent in the workroom often and not in direct uh, patient care time and face-to-face -face time uh, that is so valuable with the patients. And we hear this from the patients, right? The patient experience in, in healthcare medicine today is we don't get great, you know, yeah. satisfaction from they're patients. They're in and they're out. They're yeah. in and they're yeah. out. I mean, we hear it consistently, but this is a huge part of the problem. It's not that we're trying to meet our quota and, and just get through the list as fast as we can. It's because we are spending time trying to get the data, the information we need to, to best care for these patients. And unfortunately, so much of that is performed behind the scenes. Do you think this has anything to do with physician burnout, all, all the extra time and the information overload and the administrative burden that we all have? Yeah, no, absolutely. And actually, Mayo-led research here uh, by, by Tate Shanafelt and colleagues really shows that time spent in in the electronic health record is is associated with burnout and you know burnout is is important it's not unique to physicians we see this in our advanced practice providers we see this in our nurses as well this is not unique to the clinic or ambulatory setting it's also there's good research actually just recently published uh, with similar phenomena seen in hospitals as well and, and burnout is important. It's, I think when people think about burnout, they think about uh, an overworked, a tired, and exhausted doctor who, who goes home and, and has you know, marital stress and has family stressors. Um, we know that it's also associated with higher rates of anxiety and depression in, in healthcare providers, higher rates of, of uh, divorce and suicidal ideation. I mean, it, it's serious, but it also has a significant impact on patient care, more likely to be associated with, with medical errors, uh, more likely to be associated with, with poor outcomes for patients. So it also has a significant importance to, to patients, not just to physicians, their colleagues, their environment, and, and uh, their families. This all sounds a little frightening. So how is Watson going to help you solve all these problems? Yeah, so I, I, I really do believe, it, you know, whether or not it's Watson, I, there are many other wonderful cognitive systems in, in development as well. Um, I, I really do believe that this is going to be how we bring joy back into medicine, that we are mm. spending less time with what we, what's been sort of dubbed the clerical burden uh, of medicine, less time doing, doing paperwork that otherwise could potentially be um, completed by uh, by a computer system. Um, so not just the clerical burden, but also the cognitive burden. And I think that's something we don't talk about as, as much in medicine. I don't think it's, it's hard for us to acknowledge um, to colleagues or patients that we can't possibly know it all. Um, with with the growing with the rapid expansion of, of medical knowledge and well, research. I've always told Tracy I pretty much know it all. <laughs> <laughs> he does. I, I was a little skeptical at first, but um, tell us a little bit more about the clinical trial matching program. What does yeah, that how mean? It, how it, Watson's helping in your practice right. specifically? Right. So so the Watson clinical trial matching uh, system is has been the primary uh, collaboration between Mayo uh, and IBM right now. So this uh, system uh, and this cognitive system is basically set to be reviewing uh, patient records the day prior to them coming to clinic. And again, we've trained Watson to pull out, um, again, unique to our breast cancer uh, practice right now, to pull out the key data that we need in order to help match that patient, each individual patient we're seeing in clinic, 
to our clinical trial portfolio. And right now for breast cancer, if we look at both uh, uh, our clinical trials with medical therapies, as well as our phase one clinical trials, so these are much um, drugs that are earlier in development, uh, typically phase one clinical trials, when, when we, we have over 100 open active studies. And again, it's impossible for the clinician to remember uh, each one of these, these clinical trials. So, so Watson, again, knows the list of trials, knows what inclusion and exclusion criteria are necessary for a patient to be eligible and put, could potentially participate in a trial. And it kind of brings those two, two uh, pieces of information together, the patient, their attributes, as well as the clinical trials. And then it provides us with a list of potential study opportunities, and it takes that list of you know, up to 105 right now. Honestly, we have about more like 26, 30 uh, clinical trials in the system, so we don't even have it at full capacity with all of our studies. Um, but it can take that list of 26 to 30 and whittle it down to, you know, two or three that how's may be it, relevant. How's it working? Well, so so what we have seen over the last, uh, since we implemented it into the breast cancer practice in July, so tw July of 2016, we have seen about an 80% increase in our clinical trial enrollment to our breast cancer trials, and specific, specifically the 26 to 30 that we've had uh, wow. in Watson. Amazing. So, wow. so Watson reviews the patient's chart the day before you're going to see them. Mm -hmm. uh, Watson figures out what trial, clinical trials they may be eligible for. And then does Watson make a recommendation based uh, so on a, the clinical information to help you? So it's a great question. So we do just um, to recognize the wonderful work that our, our screeners and our coordinators, our research coordinators are doing. They are, because you know Watson is still learning, they are validating the information in Watson to make sure that the list of trials that comes out uh, is indeed accurate. Um, and it allows us to continue to teach and train Watson and collaborate with IBM. Uh, but yes, at the, then at the point of care, um, I am uh, given this list of clinical trials uh, that the patient may be eligible, eligible for. But Watson, again, doesn't pick the winner. That would be more the AI approach. <laughs> well, you get to pick the winner. That, <laughs> we we yeah. get to pick the winner based on, you know, you where the patient... You have some input still. Correct. <laughs> and I think that's the great part. I, I don't look at this. I'm not afraid that AI you know, is gonna be replacing physicians. I think this is really about augmenting uh, human intelligence and, and, and so really not artificial intelligence, but more augmenting our intelligence and ability to care for patients. So it saves you hours and hours of work. Correct, you know, his, historically we, we didn't have any system in place. It was really just matching patients to clinical trials was done on an ad hoc basis. And, you know, I am a, a, a clinical investigator and I know my, you know, my three to five trials really, really well, but I might not know my colleagues as well. Or another study that was written by industry, I might not know that study as well. And I most certainly can't keep up both with the progress of new drug development in our phase one program. But I'm very engaged and, and I know we're not gonna move the needle on, on curing breast cancer uh, or cancer more broadly without evaluating these these novel therapies and so cl clinical trial and uh, participation and, and enrollment and and recruitment is so critical um, not just to meet you know Mayo's research mission but also again more broadly to to really move more quickly towards our goal of curing cancer oh it's all pretty incredible artificial intelligence in the healthcare setting teaming up teaming up with IBM's Watson We've been talking with Dr. Tafaya Haddad. She's a medical oncologist, cancer specialist at the Mayo Clinic. So great to have you here. Good luck with all your work, and go Watson. Wonderful. Thank you so much for this opportunity again.